So for people that don't know me, I'm Martin Ridley and I'm the chair of the project board. Um, and it's, it's something I've been involved with now for probably shall, two years. Um, I think it's a really exciting project, exciting project for our community. Um, and not just not just for Ashfield, but, but, but uh, wider East Midlands and, and hopefully up to North national importance. Now I'm going to give you a little bit of background about the regional, uh, um, the community regional need and the potential impact that the project can have. Next slide, please. So, I apologise if um, if some people have seen this information before. But this is some statistics that were taken from a, um, a, a, a State of the Nation report back in 2017 that looked at social mobility in the UK. And as you can see there, when you look at cold spots within the UK, Mansfield and Ashfield are at the, at the bottom of, that, of the cold spots, which is one of the worst places in the UK in terms of social mobility. But if you actually look at some of the others, there's quite a few other places in the East Midlands are in that bottom list. So. Addressing this issue around social mobility um, is, a, is a huge challenge, and that's probably where that's my personal interest. Why we started in the first place. So, to then look at um, some stats from the UK Prosperity Index 2021, Ashfield's actually ranked 217 out of 379 local authority areas in the UK. Their prosperity pillars include infrastructure, education, enterprise con conditions, economic quality, living conditions. And East Midlands as a whole is ranked fifth out of 15 regions within the UK to the prosperity index. And Ashfield, Ashfield is actually ranked 27th out of 40 districts within the East Midlands. So we don't punch particularly well in terms of prosperity. Yeah, just carrying on for some more stats from the um, prosperity index. Uh, Ashfield is ranked 310th out of 379 local authority areas within the education pillars. Um, that, that covers pre-primary, primary, secondary, further, higher, and adult skills. And East Midlands is ranked 12 out of 15 regions in the UK in terms of education. And with the lowest ranked education sector, the lowest ranked education sectors for Ashfield are primary, and uh, which obviously really well down the list in adult skills. Um, next slide, please. But manufacturing is still a key, key sector for for the East Midlands, um, and 11.9% of the East Midlands relies more on manufacturing for employment than the other regions in the UK. So it is a, an important, you know, and whilst we forecast those numbers might start to dwindle, it's still an important employment sector within the East Midlands. So um, <clears throat> if you then look at uh, Centre for Cities report, which was published in 2018, and, and it looked at the 80 largest conurbations within the United Kingdom and ranked them in terms of who, who was at the greatest risk of displacement due to the rise of automation. Um, Mansfield ranked the lowest, but Ashfield wasn't actually listed in that, in that ranked in that list um, in terms of physical numbers. But I think whatever you read from Mansfield, you can read Ashfield. So we, we are at the greatest risk of job displacement due to the rise of automation. Forecasting 29% of jobs will be at risk by 2030. Now, that risk to me that, that presents opportunity, and that's probably what we're going to, we're going to talk about today. So, <coughs> if, if the, the jobs are going to be um, available for people as we move towards 2030, are going to be more STEM based uh, careers, then we need to look at encouraging people to get to follow STEM based careers. If you look at the stats, they aren't particularly good. Young people often doubt their ability to succeed in STEM. 62% of 16 to 70 of the UK feel that subjects like science and maths are more difficult than non-STEM based subjects. Um, Sways of research shows that girls in particular perceive the capability of STEM are unrealistically low, um, which is a striking fact, finding when given that girls outperform boys in those STEM subjects at GCSE and A-level, but they don't necessarily follow those follow STEM, STEM based careers. So where does the observatory fit in? So I think if you think about the whole of the town's fund bid, and we, we, we talked about a golden thread, that golden thread really is, to, is, is addressing the, these opportunities that's going to be there, but for different types of jobs that people are currently employed in. And so that doesn't mean job losses to me, that means opportunity. 
but we need to get to prepare people for that opportunity. And to me, it starts with getting young people interested in, in science and engineering and maths. Um, and we see that the observatory <coughs> project would become a key part of that golden thread. It's the start of the journey for me. And it would also be, a, a, obviously, the other thing is obviously a, a unique visitor attraction in the area. I've talked about this golden thread, but think about the golden thread starts with getting young people interested in, in, um, in STEM-based careers, but a lot of the other transform projects, particularly at Ashfield Civil Engineering Centre, Ashfield Construction Centre, the, where that Nottingham Trent University is going to do an enterprise in Ashfield, developing greater enterprise skills within business, existing businesses in Ashfield and startups. The library innovation centres, where, we're to, where we'll have, um, people have access to learn coding skills, and to me, the ultimate pinnacle then would be the Advanced Distribution and Manufacturing Centre, which would be a, a national leading centre for uh, automation and robotics, particularly within dis in distribution and logistics. So, so it's that, it's, we told the story of it being a, a golden thread. So we hope this slide's going to play because <laughs> So I think this is a really interesting slide. So Louise Harrow. Um, you know, when you watch the video, she'll, you'll, you'll see when she speaks about when she was a child that she visited a, um, an observatory planetarium and how that inspired her you know, to follow a career, a career um, and a very prestigious career as well. And we were wondering what led you to the world of astronomy? Um, I think it was by accident. It definitely wasn't planned. So, I mean, I think many children do, and I was certainly one of them you were fascinated by space and my primary school trip to the planetarium was a memorable one and that's I, I think the planetarium is really important in that way that it gives you the excitement of looking up and seeing what's what's there um i think when i was in school i didn't realize you could really get jobs in in astrophysics or in space science so i, I wasn't you know, it wasn't a drive for me at school because I didn't know somebody from Lurgan could do that. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a really important point because I think we, what people might not know, some people may, may know, is that the trustees already do some fantastic work around actually outreach to schools. There's some brilliant work over the over the summer. Um, and, and considering, you know, what we've been through in terms of pandemic, up on a shoestring, I think you've, you've already done a bit some really inspirational stuff to, to local young people, um, and this is about building on that now. Next slide. Um, but we need your support, and you know, so we've asked, we've, we've, got, we've, we've thought about people that we know within our networks that we can ask to come together today, and this is about spreading this message out within our networks. You know, we all say there's no such thing as a free lunch. You know, what, we're, what we're looking to people today, this evening, is to, um, to think about within their networks, anybody that they can connect us with, that can provide support. Because we do have um, a shortfall in our funding programme, and Steve will touch on that a little bit in, 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 a, in a while. Um, we need to secure that max funding, um, and we have to ideas, support, connections that you may be able to make. Uh, that, just, just more brains thinking about it than, than our few brains that we, that we meet up every month on a, on a wet Monday evening. Um, we're hoping that together we can make this a reality because I think it's really exciting. And when you see some of the visualizations, Steve, Steve starts to talk about the, the project in detail, it, it's, it's so inspiring. It's, it's, it's amazing. Um, you know, I wish I'd been, it had been around when I was a kid. <laughs> so that's the end of my part of my presentation. So Steve's going to pick up now give a bit more detail about the actual project. It will be a short interlude while I swap to my presentation. <coughs> Love it, swing. Uh, yeah, if you could please, yeah. <laughs> the potter's wheel. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully it won't take that long. <laughs> okay, great. Um, well, as Martin said, uh, what we're really about is, is, is trying to inspire people, whether young or old, to, to have more of an interest in STEM. Uh, Louise Harrow's uh, little sound clip there was about astronomy because she went into astronomy, but in actual fact, this is much wider than that. This is about STEM as a, as a whole and not just astronomy. So essentially what we're doing is using astronomy 
and the wow factor that brings as, as a way to um, get into STEM subjects more, more widely. Uh, for some reason, my next slide thing is not working, so I'm going to have to do it manually. So what I thought I'd do is just spend a, a few minutes, uh, first of all, just acknowledging our supporters and introducing you to the, the team at the stage of the project that we're at now, because uh, we wouldn't be where we are today without the supporters of various forms we've had over the last couple of years. Uh, a bit of a history about the observatory, because I think that's, that's really important, because that kind of sets the context of, of, of where we came from. Uh, and touching our current outreach, because really what the expanded offer is about is about doing more of that and, and bigger and more sophisticated outreach, but still being local people reaching lo local audiences, and that's important. Then I'll go on and actually describe the, the, the plans that we have uh, and uh, where we are in the funding, just to expand a little bit on, on what Martin just said. Um, so we've had a, a whole load of pro bono support has given us all sorts of uh, advice uh, over the last couple of years and I, I could take up the whole presentation just going through who these people are uh, and explaining the good help that they've given us. And we haven't really got time to do that so I was just going to pick out the, uh, the most recent ones. Um, so I picked out Ashdown Phillips because they manage the Idlewell Centre in Sutton and Ashfield and uh, they've organised a shop for us there so we've just set up a, a shop and there that we're going to be doing some more outreach from and reach people who don't naturally get as, as far as the observatory. Um, Nottingham Trent University I'm going to pick up because uh, we've got four students uh, from Nottingham Trent working up with us at the moment to do some stakeholder engagement about um, what people want out of the new development and they're going to be operating out of that shop on certain days uh, in, in the Idlewell Centre. Uh, and uh, Vision West not because uh, we're working with them. What their students are doing is starting to build a new website for us, do new um, um, uh, newsletters and things like that. Uh, and quite frankly, those two, both Nottingham University and Vision West not, I could have put in a different category because whilst they're giving us really valuable support, what we're doing is, is giving them exposure to the real world and real clients and, and you know, work, working for real people who have to achieve something and, and, and not just an academic exercise. And, and I guess that's kind of what we're about uh, in, in a nutshell. Um, so, you know, that could have been in different categories. Um, when I get on a little bit later and I start talking about where we are with the funding journey at the moment and uh, what we've achieved so far, uh, I'll be talking a little bit about uh, what the people here have provided because we wanted to raise some money to demonstrate that we could raise money and that there was interest in the local area and at that time we'd set ourselves a target of raising 10% of the design money to, to get us through to a planning application and all of those companies named there uh, gave us direct financial donations to, to help us on that journey so I just want to acknowledge them. Uh, we've got a project board um, which are giving us that strategic steer. Um, so uh, three out of the four people on the board are, are here either in person or, or, or virtually. But we, you know, we need that broader picture, we need that strategic view to, to get us to the right place. Uh, incidentally, as I go through this presentation, you'll be seeing lots of stills. Uh, we've just appointed the architects, and I'll come on at the moment, and, and these are some initial uh, graphics done by the architect with conceptual drawings of what we want the new facility to look like and they're sort of scattered through uh, the presentation so we've moved away from uh, an earlier version that we had where we had uh, some student interns from Nottingham University do some plans uh, we've now moved over to the professional architects and they've um, they've started to draw their plans but that, that's very recent um, so we've just appointed the design team uh, literally as of uh, last week uh, we've gone through the SCAPE framework, uh, which I guess a lot of people won't be familiar with, but they're an organisation uh, that effectively sets up uh, all the pre-contract conditions that um, a lot of local authorities use, and then they widen that to, to charities as well to, to make it easier for us to uh, let big contracts. Um, we went through a competitive tender process uh, and Woodhead Construction came out on top of that, so they're our main contractor for this job going forward. Uh, on a design and build basis and then just recently we've appointed the team that you can see there uh, to take us through to that uh, as a core design team so Claire Robert Bell uh, uh, on the architect side, HSP who are only based just down the road in, in Eastwood on the structural and civil engineering side and a partnership between RSA Cosmos and SC Engineering uh, to provide that specialist planetarium stuff because uh, this really is a high-tech facility and there are only 
five providers worldwide that deliver these services and um, you know RSA uh, that's that's no uh, I have both there on the bottom saying they're a global leader uh, in this business. So um, representatives from those are, are on the call uh, virtually, so uh, they can introduce themselves later if uh, if you feel you need to talk to any of any of those. So briefly, a bit of the history about the observatory. It was formed in 1970 by a guy called Dave Collins, who's standing at the back on the on the right there, and he's still a member uh, to this day. And it, what he didn't want to do was just um, get a load of portable telescopes that you see on tripods and stand in a field. So they set about building the observatory. Uh, they didn't have any money, so um, they had to raise money to buy the land, which they did. And then they used demolition materials from, from various projects in the area to actually build the observatory. So it was recycling out of financial necessity, uh, I guess, rather than an environmental need at the time. So for example, a lot of the observatory is built out of the uh, old canteen at Plessley Pithead. Um, the small bricks came from uh, where the uh, Four Seasons Shopping Centre is in, in Mansfield. Uh, so it, it took them a lot of time doing it at, at the weekends, um, and they gradually built the observatory and, and uh, even the telescope themselves. And as you can see in that little hexagon in the middle, uh, there wasn't a lot of thought for, for health and safety uh, back in those days. Uh, so we will be improving on that, won't we, Ted? We're all listening to this call. Yes, we will. Uh, and the observatory uh, went up. And these are just some images of the observatory uh, today. So we still have, I think, the jointly biggest telescope in the UK that members of the public can just come and have a go on and play with. And if you join the society that's based at Sherwood Observatory, then you can get trained on it, you can get pleased, and you can come and use it. So, so that is a, is a good facility for the area. Uh, the bottom right picture there shows a more recent development where we've turned the shipping container. So that bottom right is the inside of a shipping container, believe it or not. Uh, and that's our radio astronomy centre, and we, we do a lot of um, good work out with that, which I'll touch on a little bit later. And I think in recognition of the significance of that development, uh, that middle small image shows uh, Sir Francis Graham Smith, the then Astronomer Royal, who came up and opened it. And, you know, he's not the sort of person who would just turn up to the opening of an envelope. So it, did, it was a real pat on the back for the community that built this when, when he turned up to uh, do the official opening in, in the mid-1980s. What we're really about is, is outreach, and we do that through a number of different ways as we are at the moment. We have our Voyage of, of Discovery, which are really popular with the uniform groups. Uh, we, we get through several tens of those a year, or at least in a, in a normal year. Uh, adult groups, so U3A groups, um, those sorts of things, and private bookings. It's becoming increasingly popular for, you know, like birthday celebrations and things, as, as you know, as, as a treat. Uh, we run open evenings through the winter, solar days through the summer when it doesn't get dark until too late. And we're increasingly building on it on a schools programme. And we also run a more intensive night school course uh, for people to join. Um, so these are just some images that demonstrate that. These are some um, further education students that we're getting to make um, uh, comets out of, of dry ice, which is what all that smoke is. Uh, and the end result is something like that. And because it's made out of dry ice, you can see when it starts to warm up, you get streams of gas coming out of them, which is a quite visual uh, description. Uh, they've actually got Tabasco sauce in as well, which does make them smell a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> they are <almost laughs> also, it makes them smell a little bit. Right. There are organic com com compounds in there as well. Uh, this is just the inside of the Radio Astronomy Centre uh, with our Radio Astronomy expert explaining some things to some guests. Um, and this is just to illustrate we do real science there as well. So this is looking at solar activity. And every night we download that data at the Stanford University in the US and it forms part of a global data set that they do uh, real science on. And there's a number of other real science activities going on in there as well, such as meteorite, uh, in, uh, incoming meteorite monitoring. Uh, that's just the open evenings there. And we typically get the reaction of that kid you can see on the left there, sort of literally uh, jaw dropping experiences. And when we show people the telescopes and give them a go on it, we do genuinely get jaw dropping experiences. Um, and there's a, a uniformed uh, group having uh, just experienced a, a talk in 3D. Uh, clearly, we hope to do much better than uh, red and blue 3D glasses with the uh, planetarium. But uh, that's where we start. <coughs> Uh, we're very proud of the fact we've got a partnership with ATTFE now and we're doing full day uh, school visits, primary school visits, and this is our chairman Rob uh, demonstrating how, how meteors form using a tray full of uh, flour and cocoa powder. Um, 
and we get them to make rovers. So we're not doing death by PowerPoint anymore. Uh, we get them to make Mars rovers, here's an example. And we've had, I think we've had 12 schools through in the last few months, of which we break each group into three. So we've had 36 different Mars rovers, all against the same brief. And every single one of them is different, even though it's the same brief. And that just shows the innovation that you can get out of kids. And then we get them to stand in front of the rest of the class and explain what the different features on the rover are. And uh, there's a little bit of feedback there. Um, we have them using an infrared camera, which I'll come on to. Uh, we do off-site stuff as well, so to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the uh, moon landings, we set up an exhibition at Mansfield Museum, and over the summer we got nearly 13,000 visitors through the door. So again, it just shows the popular popularity. Somebody said to us, you can't go wrong if it's got space or dinosaurs in it, as far as <laughs> uh, We have special guest speakers, this is Dame Jocelyn Bell Burnell, the discoverer of pulsars in the 1960s. Uh, and we brought her up and uh, we had an evening session in, in a local school where, where she talked about her role in that and, and tried to inspire uh, young girls to, to go into a science career. And we do off-site festivals and, and exhibitions as well, just to uh, sort of spread our footprint wider than the actual observatory. I have no idea what I'm explaining in that picture. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we also do a bit outreach a bit further. Um, we were asked by the team that are building the James Webb Space Telescope um, and operating it, if we could support their outreach in local communities on the basis of the fact that, and, and again, this gets to the crux of this whole thing, is that if you're part of the community, you can reach audiences and you can relate to people who, who scientists and ivory towers sometimes uh, can't. Uh, so we've joined forces with the James Webb Telescope Scheme, as, as, as strange as that may sound, to help them with local outreach. Um, so that's the successor of the Hubble Telescope, by the way. And this is just one example of what we did. So this is us demonstrating how the Webb Telescope will be able to see through dust clouds and interstellar space. So this is my, me with my hand in a cat litter bag in optical light. Uh, and then when you switch on the, the camera that works the same way as the camera on the Webb Telescope, you can see through the plastic bag and you can see my hand inside. And that's exactly the same way that the Webb telescope will be able to see through dust clouds in space and see star forming sitting behind those dust clouds. We've got lots of qualitative feedback. I won't go through it all. I just wanted to draw your attention to that one, which was a genuine one we got two weeks ago, help these guys raise the cash towards building the project. Um, I'll just whisk through. So, so now we're on to the actual, the, the new build of the project. Um, so the goal, as Martin has said, is to inspire people to, uh, to, to study STEM or even just take more of an interest in STEM. We, we live in a very technological world now that not everybody understands. Uh, you know, witness some of the stuff around uh, vaccine scares and things like that, for example. So we bought this land next to the observatory, you can see here outlined in orange. Um, underneath that land is a Victorian reservoir that was built in the 1880s, so brick vaulted arch structure. Yeah, it gives you an idea of scale there, that person doing some survey work. And the objective is, is to turn the reservoir itself in, into a science discovery centre. So um, that's uh, the architect's impression of what the inside of the reservoir will look like when we're done with it. Uh, a mixture of meeting spaces and an exhibition space. And on top of the reservoir, the plan is to, to put a planetarium. Um, so it'd be a 10 metre dome planetarium uh, and we would continue to do the sort of stuff we now we do now, which is much more of it because um, we, we are capacity limited now. We, we hit our capacity limit on visitor numbers. Uh, obviously, we'd upgrade the experience through the planetarium and the other stuff. Uh, lots of community uses as well for exhibition spaces, arts, because you know, a planetarium is basically a hemispherical projection screen. You project what you want on it, community cinema, the one in Newcastle, for example, they use it for weddings, um, corporate hires, away days, and, and there's also potential wider uses than we've got in the business plan at the moment. So now what I'm going to do is run a video provided by RSA Cosmos. It just describes some of the stuff you can see on the dome. Um, it isn't great on a flat screen because it's designed to be projected on a hemisphere that you're sitting in the middle of, but it, it, it gives you a very strong impression of what we can do. Just two minutes long. <coughs>
that's it, experience it properly. You really need to be sitting in a dorm and imagining that all, all of that stuff is absolutely surrounding you. It gives you a feel for the, for the range of stuff you can do now. And the thing um, that's important to remember about that is that's all real data. So when you see that surface of Mars, that isn't some artist's impression of what Mars looks like. That's the real satellite data of the surface of Mars that you're driving all the way. Uh, so, okay, on, on to the uh, uh, more business-like stuff. Uh, we've uh, developed a business plan, a financial model uh, that we've stress tested. Uh, and that shows that, um, you know, once we've got the thing built, once we've got the capital sorted out, it does self-sustain uh, on an annual basis in terms of running costs, including employing staff. Uh, we've done some stress testing on that as well, which uh, shows that, you know, even if we're out on our numbers a bit, and most people think we're conservative on the numbers, actually, then it's still sustainable. And we've actually even got room to uh, employ a, a, another full-time equivalent person if, if we hit the numbers that our, our core business model's made on. So we, we're we confident that it's sustainable and it's uh, you know not going to turn into a potential Olympic park uh, that gets used once and, and then they, they struggle with. Um, the important thing to emphasize is, is that while we can show washes its face on a financial sustainability point of view, that's the actual important point. It's the benefit that we get from inspiring people and encouraging STEM subjects. That's the real benefit. And that's the piece of work we've got to do before we submit the business case to, to government and under the Tenants Fund programme is to somehow see if we can uh, monetize some of those benefits. So there'll be a trickle down effect there. Um, you know, how, you'll get a certain number of thousands of people through the door. A, a percentage of them will be inspired to follow STEM subjects. A, a percentage of them will go on to university and study STEM subjects, uh, you know, we'll get higher salaries as a result of it and hopefully still come back to the community and do good things in the community about it. And, you know, how many people do you need to get through the door to uh, get the next Richard Branson or, or Brian Cox? So that's basically, um, you know, what the, what the core benefit is, is not the fact that we have a bit of turnover that does get reflected back into the community again in, in terms of reinvestment of that direct income. Uh, there was feedback when we did this last time, when we did a, a, an event a year ago, to say, well, why are you waiting until it opens to uh, start doing that outreach? You, you should really start doing it during the design phase. And Woodhead have taken that on board. So this is the commitment that they came up with to basically start now and go through the construction phase in terms of work placements, uh, STEM events, uh, student visits, and all that sort of stuff. So we're very keen on this whole thing flowing through from now and not, not just waiting until the opening day. In terms of timetable, uh, we've literally started the detailed design last week. Um, we think we can get the planning application in by um, April next year. Uh, and through that time and then the few months after that, that's when we set ourselves the challenge of securing the remaining capital funding. Um, and if we do get enough funding in place, then uh, we can con start construction about this time next year uh, with a grand opening during 2024. We're looking at something like a 65 week construction period. Uh, that's if we build it in one go. If we don't fully hit our construction, uh, our funding target, then we have asked the architect to design it in two phases so we could have a break, open the planetarium, and then finish refurbishment. But uh, being 100% honest, that's, that's not a 50-50 split in the budget. We have to spend more than half of the budget to, to, to open half of the facility because there's, there's, there's common infrastructure that you need to create. But, you know, if we don't fully hit the funding target, then we do have that option to do it in two phases if, if we so choose. It's also more expensive to do it in two phases, incidentally, if you have to demobilize and come back and start again. But we, we'll, we'll get to where we get to. So where are we with, with funding? We, we estimate uh, that the project budget would be 5.25 million. That's based on the old student designs. And we think that I'm probably be undercut with the current architect's designs, but uh, guys, if I put words in your mouth, I know you're on the call, so i say so afterwards. But um, we're looking at that sort of budget at the moment uh, without the contingencies in. Um, so that's, that's the target. Uh, as I mentioned, our founding sponsors before, uh, uh, we've had £26,000 in direct donations just to kind of get us to first base uh, to demonstrate that commitment. Uh, we've had two core funder applications on the go. Uh, very pleased to be part of that overall successful Towns Fund bid. 
uh, and that's given us a commitment uh, of uh, 2.25 million. Now, there's a lot of hoops to jump through to get that money, so that isn't in our bank account at the moment. We've got to put the business case to central government, uh, but that, you know, that, that's, that's the baseline that we're starting from. Uh, and uh, just off last week, we, we had a little bit of early release money, well, quite a lot of early release money to start the design phase uh, going. The advantage of doing that is obviously as we start going through planning and, and, and demonstrate that this thing is real and it's going to happen, um, we're hoping that that will open, open up potentially more funding streams that, than would otherwise uh, be available to us because some funds are only interested in shovel-ready projects. Um, we were working with the National Lottery Heritage Fund and they paid for all of the early work and some upgrade work to the <coughs> current observatory. And uh, they were very interested in it pre-pandemic. Um, and um, we got quite a long way down the line with them as, as the second core funder. They would be providing uh, a few million pounds worth of funding as well. But unfortunately, as they came out of the pandemic, they, they've changed their priorities, hopefully only temporarily. But at the moment, all of their funding is going into direct pandemic recovery. Uh, so. Um, so we don't meet their criteria at the moment. That that could change, and we are hearing whispers that it might. But um, at the moment, we don't meet their criteria. So we are we are, um, you know, looking for a, a range of funders now to, to meet that shortfall that we have at the moment. That much funding. But so we've taken all of that in. Uh, we're we're about there somewhere. So um, a little bit short of halfway. So I'm just going to end uh, with an animation uh, that our architects put together to show um, the concept of what the facility might look like when it's built. Uh, bearing in mind, this is just the, the design proposal, as it says there. Um, so it will be modified as a result of uh, consultation uh, with our neighbours um, and all the other stakeholders, uh, which is a process we'll just be getting into very soon. I think um, the background is just because they didn't have time to put all of the background in that color.
that's the end of the presentation. If we can get that far just with voluntary effort, I think what we can now know is now that we've got a professional team appointed. <laughs> so I will uh, stop screen sharing there and hand back over to Martin. Yeah, so just before we open it up for discussion, I think I was sat looking at it and thinking about the heritage of where it started from. And I think all my life, I've probably lived in the crow flies within a three mile radius of the observatory. Um, very much like Gary, we were growing up um, in, in, in the community. We, we could look out of our windows and we knew where our destiny lay because we, we, we could see coal mines. We knew that's where we were going to be going to work. Um, times have changed dramatically now, but you know, I think there are, from, hopefully, from the stats that, that I've I talked about in my point of presentation. Now, we have got an exciting future ahead of us uh, within our community, but we need to be prepared to capitalise on that community, because if we don't, then I think we'll just end up becoming a skills vacuum for other parts of the country, and we'll draw people in and we'll end up with mass unemployment. So, you know, can't stress it enough, but that's why I feel passionately about this project, that this really is the first part of the jigsaw to unlock this career path for the jobs that are going to be there for people our young people moving forward and it's going to come faster than we could possibly imagine so um, we're going to, before we again before you go to the floor i'd quite like to ask ian if we could just we'd like to say a few words as president of the chamber and um, you know from a skills point of view you, you obviously run some very successful businesses in your, in your career um, and you know and i know that you you've seen some of the challenges that presented to us yeah thanks martin um I, I, I'm absolutely delighted that the uh, the, the chamber is involved in, in, in this project because I, I I think it's exciting. I, I think it's ambitious, it's inspiring, and and, and uh, uh, very imaginative. In fact, to sum all that up, is, is a word my wife actually used, and you used it, Steve, earlier on this morning. My wife said to me, "Yeah, what are you doing today?" And I told her, and I said I was coming here, and she said, oh, "What's that all about?" So I told her, and she said, "Wow." And, and, and you use the word wow. Uh, this project has a wow factor. There, there, there's no doubt about it. For me. Uh, and, and Martin, at the, at the start of the meeting, went through, I was writing them down, all, all those quite disturbing metrics on social mobility and adult skills and education and job displacement, uh, uh, which are quite worrying for, uh, for us in this part of the world. But the, there are two features, I think, for me, that stand out features as far as this project is concerned. Uh, and the first is uh, uh, inspiring and encouraging young people to get involved in STEM uh, subjects and STEM, STEM education. Now, I, I speak as someone who, who uh, actually science was my, my, my best subject in school, um, uh, if I can call any of my subjects best, but uh, uh, science was certainly there. And I went on to, to do a, a science degree in chemistry, as it so happened. Um, uh, and then I joined the bus industry and spent uh, the last 45 years uh, running and uh, operating uh, and owning bus companies. Uh, and a number of people have said to me, you wasted your science degree. Uh, 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 and I said, well, no, I don't think I did, actually. Because the one thing a science degree has done for me, it's given me a very analytical mind. It's made sure that I am evidence-based for every decision that I take. Um, it's given me an inquiring mind uh, and it's encouraged me to push boundaries. And I think that's what a science degree and science subjects do for you. Uh, and, and I think my, uh, my business career has been based on the, the very important uh, lessons I learned during, while I was doing my, my, my science subjects. Um, uh, so that, that, that's uh, one of the standout benefits for this project. The other one, I think, is, is the wider benefit, benefit of the, this being a, a landmark attraction. Um, uh, and it, it will encourage, uh, and don't we need it in this uh, uh, part of the world, uh, more and more visitors. Uh, it will be an important part of the visitor economy. And you're talking about 24,000 visitors a year. The, the benefit to the local community, to that number of people uh, coming here and going to restaurants and pubs and hotels and everything else is huge. Uh, the, the, the economic impact is uh, absolutely uh, uh, huge. So, uh, yeah, I, 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 I'm all behind this project and uh, I implore everyone uh, on this call and beyond to, to, to get involved and get your networks involved because it really is it's a magnificent project. It really is. So Matt, have you to give some comments from a council point of view? Yes. Yeah, so for those, those who don't know, I'm, I'm Matthew Ralph. I'm councillor at Ashfield District Council and portfolio holder for regeneration and planning. And uh, Martin and I have been working 
rather a lot over the last few years uh, on, on uh, uh, the Towns Fund and Future High Streets Fund projects to, to drive things forward. I mean, I won't reiterate a lot of what's been said about uh, the, the indices of deprivation and so forth because they're well known, but I do think it is a crucial part of all of this that um, part of that picture is that kids growing up here today don't see uh, the, the options and the horizons that are out there of what they can do with their lives. You know, the, it, like you were saying when we were growing up, that uh, there was the future of the coal mines. Well, even they've gone now. Yeah. And this, for me, is such a critical part of broadening of the horizons of our youth today. And what broader horizons can we get than taking them off to space and uh, showing them there are, there are no horizons blocking their way. They can go anywhere. Um, and, you know, the point you made about uh, a, a science degree, um, I think uh, the, the other part of that is curiosity. I think, you know, instilling in people a lifelong curiosity for learning and knowledge, I think is such a critical part of helping turn around us as a society. And so this for me is absolutely about lighting that fire in people's bellies of understanding there's a whole world out there to learn about. Let, let's let's go and learn about it. And so, you know, again, I implore everybody to get involved in this because what better legacy can you leave behind than a facility that's going to light a fire in people's hearts and knowledge seeking for an entire generation and then generations after that. So um, I'm gonna open it up for co comments and questions now. Um, maybe Colin, if you could just look for hands raised, we'll open it up to the people in the room um, to start off with. And then if you, if you can just bring people in as hands are raised, we'd appreciate that. Thank you. So have you got any questions or comments in the room? I mean, you, Andy, you're working on the, I mean, you're working at the other end of this, this yeah. story. Yeah, with the ADMC, but yes. you know, to me there is, there is a golden thread between these two projects. Absolutely, so I'm Andy Dean, I'm, I'm leading on the Automated Distribution and Manufacturing Centre, uh, which is another project within this Towns Fund bid, and uh, there are strong links because we're very focused on um, the challenge of skills and, and, and wage uplift and how to get people to aspire to want to do um, STEM-related work and, and have STEM related careers and, um, you know, upskill up from manual jobs into high value jobs. And like Martin said, right at the beginning, automation is an opportunity, not a threat. Um, but in order to get people on the bus and on the journey, you've got to prove to them that's the case and show them the way and, and um, projects like this will do that. Um, I've also done a lot of work with schools as an enterprise advisor um, over the last few years. And for me, the, the correlation between exposing students and at the younger age to different types of opportunities and then how they then go and follow them up. Um, the data I've seen from Leicestershire Lep, in fact, on that is extremely strong. So the more exposure you can give to kids about STEM-related opportunities, then that's only going to be a good thing, in my view, and will certainly help. And this is a great enabler to do that, as will be the ADMC, I hope, too. Yeah. I don't you want to make any comments, Nick, because I know we've known each other for a long time and we've, <laughs> we've seen our connections. And we've been talking about this issue around skills challenges for a long time and it just used to getting worse rather than better. Yeah, well, if you saw our conference um, this week, you'll see Keir and, uh, and team sort of making comments on the skills gap. Um, and we, we hear about it all day, every day. Um, so, yeah, it is. it needs to be addressed. And, I, you know, I, I'd be quite proud to see something like this develop in the Midlands, obviously. Kind of representing the region. Um, I suppose my question is, where are you at in terms of reaching out to, to businesses for the support? I know obviously you've got your foundation sort of um, supporters, but where are you beyond that? What have you, what has, have you tried to do so far and how could the CBI help? I think we've tried to use our existing networks and that's one of the reasons we're calling people together this evening. Mm -hmm. to get, we, to, we want, if you can, we want asking people to, to communicate that message to their wider networks because you know, the more people we tell, the more people will get interested. Um, we've not tried almost, we've not tried direct approaches to business for, for financial no. support, but it, you know, it's, a, it's been about telling that story. I think we've got real, you know, this, this has been an evolving picture when we got the town's fund money and so we've, we've got that first release of, of, of the money to get the, the design done. So this is part. This is part of the, the reason we're here. It's easier. 
Yeah, I think we, we kind of, we've held back a, a little bit on it for, for two reasons. One, we wanted to get to this point where we had the team so that it was a, it's now a, a real project rather than just a, a glimmer on our eye with the support we've had from the early release tanks for the money. And, and the other, quite frankly, was the, the pandemic. We, we did look at this a while back and thought, we can't start approaching businesses for this when half of their staff are on furlough. Yeah. It just didn't feel right. So we've kind of held off uh, till, till now, really. And this this meeting really starts that journey we want to go on about, about engaging that wider business community. I, I have four children. And to think that we'd have something like this on our doorstep is something, you know, a passion of mine and a reason that I'd like to get involved personally. Um, from a CBI perspective, I'd be more than happy to kind of, you know, share share the story and, and support however I can. So, yeah. And, I mean, I, I would be happy to come along to any meeting that you think is appropriate and tell yeah. the story as well. So, Absolutely. yeah. So obviously yeah. leveling up is like the buzzword. And I think, you know, projects like this are really important. So, yeah, Martin knows I, I'll, uh, I'll do whatever I can to engage. I'm, I'm keen to hear from people virtually. I'm going to be really really cruel and pick on somebody. I can see Matt bust that right in, middle, right in the middle of the screen. So I know Matt works for Woodhead and there's a lot of outreach stuff within the schools. So you know, what sort of impact do you think this could make that? Hi, Martin. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, first, so I'm, I'm Matt Bust, Business Support Manager at uh, Woodhead. Um, it's already been kind of mentioned in, in the room um, in terms of the, really a project like this, how it can inspire um, the next generation, really. A big part of my role at Woodhead is do a lot of work in, in schools, um, colleges, both primary schools, secondary schools. Um, I'm an enterprise advisor as well. Um, I get invited into a lot of schools to do like talks and things like that. But when you've got a, a project like this, that's a, an amazing project, a really inspiring project. If you've got that, that you can relate what you're talking to them about and make it seem more real, um, it, it makes it seem more real to the individuals and it does, it does inspire them. Um, so, so for us, this my role really within this project is going to be working with a lot of a lot of the local primary, secondary schools, colleges, etc., um, to offer the opportunities that a project like this can offer to hopefully inspire them um, to think about uh, a career in STEM. Uh, I'm a STEM ad, uh, ambassador myself. I've been for about five or six years, and I've delivered a lot of STEM-based um, workshops in the past. And going in there and people not really knowing what it is and then coming out and seeing what an impact it can have, it really does make a difference. And I've seen firsthand that. So I'm really looking forward to, to getting involved. Um, I can't really, can't wait to get started really. I'm going to jump in at this point as well. Um, so I'm Colin Hutchison. I, I'm here with a, actually several hats here. Uh, so I run the planetarium at Think Tank Planetarium in Birmingham. And I'm also, a member of the Council of the British Association of Planetaria that represents all planetaria in the UK. And we, we've, we, we did a survey amongst all our members and of all the planetaria in the UK, uh, portable domes and fixed domes like, like Think Tank, we reckon we have a reach annually of about 1.2, 1.4 million people. And that recognition of that is allows us to get funding for for shows outreach and we also tied in with the project with the James Webb telescope um, but we also see the the benefits and the excitement with students children families when we're talking about the night sky talking about the solar system and indeed I, I even I was dealing I had presenting to our special needs group the other day where the, quite a challenging group but the teachers actually said this is the most engaged we've ever seen them and the most excited they've ever been and some of the comments they were making afterwards was uh, the, the children themselves like I think science is my favorite subject and I want to do more how do I do it so having those conversations and that experience of planetaria uh, and science science discovery centers um, I think is a good good point and a kind of good go-to place for people who are wanting to enter in into science and STEM subjects. I think something just to pick up on, you know, you know the bit of blame that we got from Eric's Lottery Fund was a difficult pill to swallow because you know, whilst we did, they couldn't say we'd got the money, I think they were making all the right sort of noises and were looking at us favourably. So to come out and say that the funding criteria had altered, I think we'd be in a very different position 
today if that funding had been available to us. Um, Steve's done a lot of work recently. We're working with a really good fundraiser who specialised in the Fund fundraising. Um, we've, we've obviously now that door's closed to us. Steve's now done a lot of work finding a, 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 a new fundraiser who's looking at other avenues. So that, that this really out of the press that is. Yeah, it is. Uh, yeah, we, we appointed uh, the week before last. So yeah, um, as I say, this is we've been really focused on getting the design team. Um, organising the point, there's been a lot of work just to go through to get that team I showed you. So now the, the focus of attention all, all turns to, to raising the money. Yeah. Really is, is, as well as being the client side for the actual design, because we've got to build something that looks nice yeah, and yeah. works at the end of the day as well. Yeah. We've got a great team. Yeah, I think yeah, we don't even made that comment about this attraction as well. And I can't remember it was, but, but they were quite, it was quite interesting because we actually classed what they called a shoulder attraction. So we yeah. can actually attract people outside the natural natural period when when people during the summer months you know we're not we're not we're not tied to one particular time of year this thing can run for more year so you know it's, it's a bit of a traction it's got lot, lots of them um, lots of potential yeah there was some funding actually available a couple of years ago and we we ticked all the, the, the boxes apart from the fact that we didn't have planning permission at that, that stage so that was the meeting that you and i went to well, we just seem to be ticking every box apart from the fact that we want to start soon and we couldn't. Yeah, we and it, I think it was important for us as the project team. Um, and I, 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 yeah, I, I'm just so passionate about getting this project over the line. Um, Paul Humphreys from East Midlands Chamber, I met Steve and colleagues at the, of the observatory on a very cold January morning. I think it was January the 4th, about three years ago, we were huddled around one fire and having coats on. And they said, we want to build the planetarium and, 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 and I was just absolutely blown away with this project and everybody that I've talked to has just been so enthused by what we're trying to achieve here um, and I employ every, I mean employ seems to be the right word here but anybody with those business connections into the region and beyond we now need to look beyond the region I think as well to really kind of make this project sing and make this project work um, I really wanted to do my Bob Geldof impression. Well, <laughs> Martin, over to, you, over to you, you could probably do it better than me. <laughs> I, I just wonder, sorry, sorry if I'm going to put you on the, uh, the spot, Becca, but I know we've got Becca on here, who's a primary school teacher whose class came to uh, the observatory for one of those full day experiences. So it'd be great if you could say a couple of words, Becca. I, uh, I'm really sorry that I joined late. Um, but actually, I joined at the point when you were talking about social mobility and disadvantage and raising the profile of STEM. And actually, that's what I walked away feeling that what you did, Steve and your team, you challenged that and you left a lasting impression on our children to the point where my class are asking me regularly, when are we going to the space centre? Because they've talked about it on the playground. It, it's not something they've forgotten. And actually, you know, I know that you haven't got the, the most... I don't know, up to date facilities compared to some of the other planetariums. But what you did with what you'd got, your passion, your enthusiasm, the structure of those two days. I mean, obviously, it was sorry, I went twice because I took half my class and then the other half. It, it was nothing short of outstanding. It was, it, you know, it was rich in subject knowledge. You know, it wasn't, how do I describe it? It very carefully constructed in the fact that it gave children enough knowledge to be able to access space and the awe and wonder of it but at a time when they were very aware that the curriculum had not been able to be taught due to COVID. And so no child was alienated, all the children accessed it. We'd got a variety of needs in that setting, children who were one-to-one, -one, children that had been on part-time timetabling that actually attended that day, that whole day, that was their first day at, at school in two years. You know, it was, we went from doing the space rover, we, we, looked, we went and experienced the, the, the telescope, it was left, <laughs> left a lasting impression on me, let alone the children. But it is, I think, the potential you have got to reach out into our community is phenomenal. And I was so grateful for what you did for our children because you did raise aspirations. You know, they, they know that they're not all saying they want to be astronauts. It's not about that. But they know that actually there is an education out there for them and that they can go and they can experience things like this. And I think that when you're up and running, you will put Sutton on the map and you will make, you know, it's something that we should really be proud of. And I, it was an absolute privilege to be part of the, I know the schools that you managed to reach out of and, and to provide that too. So thank you again. Thank you. I didn't pay her to say that, but yeah. Sam Handley, I would ask you to make a comment as an employee, because I know as an employee, you, you go above and beyond in growing your own talent. 
So you know, what, what sort of Thanks. impact do you think this could make on, on your business? Thanks, Martin. Well, it's funny because I remember the uh, the meeting pre-COVID pre, pre um, and um, I'm delighted that there's energy behind this again because it's not something that, um, that personally I've forgotten about either. Um, you know, ultimately we we struggle in terms of apprenticeship intake. We, you know, currently we've got ten percent of our apprentices, uh, the, the workforce of apprentices here. Um, but you know, we we need to we need to be able to access and, and develop skills at a much younger age in terms of the interest in STEM, um, and we we must widen that network. You know, we we must do it. I think this is a wonderful thing that's going on, and I think that it's fantastic to hear that feedback directly from Becca. Um, you know, that's really meaningful feedback and something that everybody should feel very proud of. So absolutely, as I said a couple of three years ago, we'll support this wherever we can, uh, in, in whichever means we're able to. Um, now we're all coming out of COVID, um, you know, and absolutely behind the initiative. Excellent. Oh, I picked you as well. <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments from, from the virtual room? Fiona's. Oh, Fiona, yeah, sorry. Fiona, good evening. Hello, Martin. Thank you. Sorry, I was working out on Zoom how to take myself off mute. Um, we usually use Teams and I'm fluctuating between the two. So thanks for. Uh, Bring me in. Um, so I work at Nottingham Trent University and um, I know a number of colleagues around uh, the, the physical table and the virtual table as well and um, just like to, to sort of echo the thoughts about what a brilliant initiative it is and um, I know through through NTU we've already got some connections to the observatory through the School of Science and Technology which is based in Clifton but as you will um, many colleagues around the tables will know that we're working very closely with Vision West Knox College and the university has established a higher education hub in Mansfield and so we're certainly open to looking at what more you know we could do together. Um, I was just reflecting on a, a couple of things earlier around the, the funding gap and, and, and I'm sure this is something that the, the new um, fundraising team have in mind but I'm wondering if we need to sort of think about some sort of packages that may be packages of sponsorship that we might look for or some sort of route map that we might put together around what what sorts of types of external funding we might be looking for and how we might be able to sort of work together on some of these things so I'd just like to you know lend, lend support to the to the brilliant initiative and just to sort of say that as, as colleagues know you know the university and the college are working closely together in the area and obviously very open to all of the, the different conversations and share the the challenges around um future skills needs yeah, but, yeah i think it'd be great to catch up with you um separately and talk about some of those things that you've you've raised uh I, in terms of the funding the we're, we're looking at a mixture at the moment and we're just trying to kind of land on what that mixture would look like but um you know we've looked at we're, we're thinking about everything from corporate sponsorship packages to um you know you know trusts to, to some of the you know the big funding applications like your know, heritage lottery if they change their mind or the big lottery fund or all those so there's a whole range as, as martin said we've just kind of switched horses on our, our funding efforts once the heritage lottery people stepped aside because we had a fundraising expert employed who was particularly focused on the on the lottery side of stuff that was her expertise so we've just got somebody on board um the week before last i think it was just to start looking at that wider funding landscape so so they're basically undertaking that strategic review now yeah i'd be very happy to pick, pick that up separately thank you any other comments or questions? Anybody in the room want to make a comment? <laughs> Not comment? Any bright ideas? Well, I, I think, Martin, there's a lot of reasons why uh, business in Mansfield uh, and Ashfield would want to get behind a project like this. It's not just a question of company engagement, it's community engagement as well, isn't it? You know, because I think a lot of us have recognised that there's not a lot of reasons for people to come to Mansfield and want to stay here. The same with Asheville. You know, I, I remember 30 years ago when I got an invitation to come and uh, interview to run a company here. I had to get a, I was only Bernie, 
lived most of my life near Newark. I had to get a roadmap out to find out where Mansfield Woodhouse was. I'd never <laughs> been. There's no reason to come here. And, and I still don't. You know, still live over that way. Still never come here. No reason to. And I think things like this, uh, you know, there's every reason for the local community and the local business community to support something like this. And, and the amount of money you're asking for in the scheme of things is, is you know, it's not a lot of cash. I mean, give me an idea of it. Give me the idea of the draw of these things. During lockdown, we did a, a, a virtual open evening instead of the, the real live ones that we do, and we we weren't sure what to expect on it. And you, you know, we kind of advertised it a bit, but not wild, wildly. Mm. And uh, we got seven hundred <laughs> views during that open evening. And then within forty-eight hours, when we posted it on YouTube, another seven hundred views on YouTube. And, yeah. You know, that just blew us away on. Uh, before we had to start ticketing events, before we got so popular, we used to just let people turn up at the door on open evenings. And uh, we now have to ticket them through an online ticketing system because on a clear night, we were getting 300 people turning up, just arriving at the place. And, you know, that we were, we were going to get reputational damage because we couldn't accommodate 300 people all in one go turning up. So we have, we've had to start ticketing it, also because of COVID for managing risks. But... Um, we, uh, we sell 120 tickets for an open evening now, and the December one <coughs> sold out before we even advertised it. So, you know, the demand is definitely there. Just kind of going on from what Fiona was talking about, about packaging and <coughs> some sort of sponsorship, uh, well, packages, or, or working out the best ways of different size and different types of members getting involved, members, I'm talking about CBI members, obviously. I think that ESG, you know, the sort of social values part of yeah. ESG is so big to business, giving back to their communities after, you know, all the furlough and all the money they've taken out. I think it's really something that is, should be quite an easy sell, really. Um, that with the fact that, the you know, the talent pipeline is so minimal at the minute, surely it's something that if you get the packages right, I think you should have quite a good buy-in. Yeah, I mean, I, I sit in some of the, the D2N2 lab. Uh, advisory boards where we work with Martin and, and others, and we see a lot of these statistics coming out about the, uh, the, the social demographics and the problems of the region. Uh, and one of the one of the issues that keeps coming up time and time again is lack of ambition. Mm. And there's a real problem in this area generally with a lack of ambition of young people. Uh, and, I, and I do think at the end of the day. As you say, if you want to do something space-wise, I mean, that's the sort of thing that really opens people's yeah, minds, isn't it? it? The nearest place you go to is is Leicester now. When I, mean, I took yeah. my kids to Kennedy Space Centre, so it's a bit further. But, you know, I didn't... <laughs> it's a lot cheaper to get to. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to say, you know, here is a lot cheaper to get to. But, you know, that, that's, we recognise, don't we, as a, as a D2N2 organisation, that there's generally one of the things that's going to hold this area back in the future is a lack of ambition amongst young people and I think there's so these sort of initiatives are the sort of things which are going to try and open people's horizons a bit more. Yeah Martin can I add to that because I think one of the things that's different from I'd say when we were all young is that space was something that was done by NASA and the or the, and the, or the Russian government but the world's changed space exploration is now a commercial venture for okay at the moment a very few uh, very well off large high tech organizations but the point I want to make is that um, young people coming through they make a connection with brands they recognize and understand and trust and I guess they're all buying off Amazon they're all using yeah. Google and you've got that sort of commercial connection which is very different to when I guess we were we were all we were all younger maybe there's something there I'm not suggesting we I was, I was looking to see whether Tim Telford was still at home I think he's dropped there. he was there yeah mm -hmm. well, just just to, just to add yeah. to that well, I mentioned the web telescope one of the yeah. points we make about the web, web telescope is, is that part of that telescope would be made in the UK the uh the, the project lead for the camera on the telescope yeah. is, is British and it's British engineers <laughs> and British scientists who have who have led the project to put that together so the message we give the kids is you don't have to move to Florida as attractive as that might be you don't have to <laughs> move to Florida to uh to be a space scientist <laughs> or a space engineer and, and and there's much more to it than being an astronaut yeah the reason I would give Tim was on there because Tim and I looked at the business opportunities together um, which is around all the, the amount of satellites are going to be launched from British soil in yeah. 10 years. You know, so again, it's not something that I'm saying that's it, something that's mm -hmm. right on the doorstep. Matt, no, you've got your hand raised. 
Hi, hello everybody. Um, so I'm Matt Bohm, a uh, business owner, Nottingham business owner of a company called Print4 Limited. Um, also, also fortunate to be a director of a, a recently formed company called Growing Green uh, Limited. We won't go into that, it's not about that for now. But what I would like to say is I've just been, what I see is very, very fortunate. One, I've had four days off work this year, which is absolutely amazing. But I utilise that four days to go and fulfil childhood dream. Um, and I flew to Iceland and uh, got to the top of an active volcano, which is something that I've always wanted to do, a bit obsessed with them. But while I was actually there, I've also visited for the first time ever a planetarium. Never been in one, don't really know a lot about them. And it was absolutely mind blowing. And it's just made me feel very small and very insignificant in this world. And I think if, if you guys can do 10% of what I feel at the moment by visiting a planetarium, you're onto a winner. You really, really are. And you're going to change people's minds and the younger generation, you can get them through that door. You're definitely onto a winner. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. Yeah. Remember I'm saying you flew back today? Uh, yesterday. <laughs> and, and so just jumping in following on from that is also worthwhile saying and I think there might be some people from RSA on here as well that is not just astronomy that we can do in planetaria uh, Steve touched on it that you can display pretty much everything but a lot of planetaria they can do whether it's do content relating to biology relating to chemistry physics engineering and and basically, it's only your imagination that constrains you. And so it's, it's yes, planetary traditionally are astronomy, but we can do a lot more. And that's that's one of the benefits of digital planetary these days. Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, we, we, we've talked a lot about the issues in the area in terms of social mobility and so forth. But actually, I think it's also worth highlighting though, the opportunities that we have. We we are extremely well located in the UK. We've got a lot of brilliant businesses already here that not a lot, not enough people know about. And there's a, a lot of work going on about well, sharing that knowledge. But the other thing that I think that's great is that we've we've got a whole network now of partner organisations who are really pulling in the same direction to turn this area around. And give us a bright future going forward and so i don't want people to go away from this you know thinking that the, the, yeah. there's a negativity there is absolutely an energy and a drive and a direction that is on the way up and this is such a key part of it yeah. i really want people to get get on board we'll send that back so as we're saying those words i do think yeah, yeah. the negatives here there is a lot of positive huge positives and martin we, we we can turn this around a bit we've talked about packages for some of these really key organizations you put the names up, the ADMC's got some, yeah. this project's got them, but how many thousands of small businesses have we got? And there's some fantastic ones. Yeah. And I just go left field on your marketing a little bit. You know I'm a football fan. Yeah. <laughs> At Stadium Light in Sunderland, when they put their names, their Hall of Fame on their walls, they made three million pound in the first season. Every football club has done it. In your design stage, could you have a wall that is a Hall of Fame for businesses mm -hmm. or families to buy into £25 a brick yes. with a name in it, you'll get that from a lot of businesses, which will quickly add up to the corporate packages you're talking about. I'll buy the first brick. It's a bit of a legacy thing then because you've, yeah. you've actually put yourself there and that wall will be there for well, in a day. It's similar with the response of the seats in the new theatre that is built. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of bricks in that reservoir as well. <laughs> we can get the construction company from Vision West Notch to make the bricks for you. <laughs> no, I am conscious of time because we've got to be, we're going to be kicked out in about 17 minutes. So um, I'm just going to have a quick last look at the virtual room so everybody's got a hand raised when you strongly wanted to make a comment. Um, I'm going to be really cool and ask Theresa if she wants to just wind things up. Yeah, perspective. Well, I think wow is the word, isn't it? And you know, we've been on board. I mean, there's, there's partners around here, you know, that, that started working with you in early days and seeing the, the vision that you had and supporting that feasibility work to get us to this stage. And 
you know, there's 17 other projects in the town's fund that is going to have an impact, not just on this, but in the, when, you know, Matthew talks about deprivations, low skills, you know, crime reduction, a number of those projects are going to touch on other things to raise those aspirations. And that's where we're at. And I think that's what Discover Ashfield does. And we need to look beyond, you know, Ashfield and Mansfield as well, because this, along with ADMC, they're not just local projects, mm. East Midlands one, yeah. you know, and if you look to Leicester for your next closest one, where do you put your boundaries? So I would suggest that we, uh, I mean, Fiona, thank you very much for that, because it's something I was going to suggest <laughs> around putting that package in place, but look wider than just this area, because it, it's not just about building this fantastic facility, it's about leaving the legacy and also that second spend and building the economy, which is going to be really, really important, you know, and I've always been a big advocate advocate for this project. Maybe you should have told the, the virtual room what, what, what your role is. Oh, right. Uh, so I'm Therese Hodgkins. I'm Chief Exec of Ashfield District Council. So I've been with the district since 2006. So I've been really passionate about the area of Ashfield and Mansfield, because I live in Mansfield. So I do cross both boundaries in making sure that, and I think as Chief Exec, that's my role, is to inspire, you know, the, the next generation, but leave a legacy. And one of the things that we're doing through the Towns Fund is understanding where we are now, and then in five years time, seeing what huge impact that's gonna have and the legacy that it's gonna leave. And we're not gonna be able to measure some of that now. So that skills development is a journey. And I think the social impact and the economic impact is something that we can measure tangibly over these five year period. So it's, it's really exciting. And I, I think we need to get that package in place so that partners around this table, partners at 2020, you know, partners can sell this, that we all buy into this project and we all go and sell it at every opportunity. If we had that material to do that, and, you know, some of the suggestions that's come forward about buying bricks and, and, and you know, it, it might seem silly. And we were really disappointed when the Heritage Lottery Fund changed their remit from a funding and, and fingers crossed it'll come back round um, because you know it's over two million pounds and whilst people saying it doesn't sound a lot it is a lot um, but the enthusiastic bit is is that we're now on the journey we're starting we're moving to the next stages we're not just talking about it we're actually going to see something happening and I think that's really important to take people through that journey as well uh, and, and maybe I don't know if you thought about it getting some video you know, coverage of doing that. I mean, we do it on all our facilities. We're just building the leisure centre in Kirby and video image of taking us through that journey of having a site, clearing it, building the facility and selling that is going to be a real selling point. So it's just not about the funding package. It's about how as well you can speak to businesses about how they can bring that social impact. Because yeah. it's, it, it, it's really important across, across both districts and also East Midlands. So maybe one of your packages and is thinking about how we can hit that wider determinants rather than just here in Ashfield and Mansfield. But yeah, as you can see, I've got lots of passion for it. And, you know, thank you all for coming in. You know, there's, there's lots of people around this table that have played a part in that. And there's lots more people that need to come to this table to play a part in it. So just finishing on, it's not just this project. We've got other projects happening. Um, you know, and, and part of that package is how then you can help other businesses sell what they're doing as part of that sponsorship. I was going to say this is a great launch pad now to really take this forward. We've got the design team in place. It's more than the idea now. Yeah. And this is a real time that we can really accelerate forward and get people on board, get organisations on board, get support on board, make sure the business community is behind it, make sure the education sectors fully aware of it as well this is a real step change moment yes. for us yes. to make a difference and that's the different sell isn't it now yeah we've, we've yeah. been talking about it we've been doing feasibility works we've got some funding and we're going to the next yeah. stage 100 we've got a couple of comments in the chat that we're, I think you we're just say goodbyes, <laughs> <laughs> just goodbyes. <laughs> yes. most, most of the comments is uh, thanking us for such an inspiring meeting and the opportunity to share. So, um, is there anything we missed, Steve?
I'd just like to, to state and wrap up. Uh, really, thank you to all those businesses that I talked about and others at the beginning who have got us <coughs> this far. And um, a future thank you for everybody who's going to be involved going, going here. And I've now got a big list of people to organise meetings with. Too. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, if any, any of the bright ideas, if they go away, think about the next few days. Um, if you've got contact, contact me or Steve or uh, reply to Pippa, who is my PA, who sent the invitations out, and they'll, that will get, get fed back to me, won't it? Yeah. So, on that note, I shall uh, bring the presentation to a close. Thank you everybody for attending. Um, have a good evening, and uh, let's keep the fingers going. Hopefully, when we meet next time, we might be thinking about tennis and soil over. <laughs> 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 Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.